Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie Follett Cook. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to our RSET advanced webinar, High Resolution NO2 Monitoring from Space with TropoMe. Um, my name is Melanie Follett Cook. I'm a scientist here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh, near Washington, DC. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Brock Levins and Selwyn Hudson-Odoi and Pawan Gupta. Our first session this morning, uh, Remote Sensing of NO2, OMI Data Products and Tools is very OMI focused. Um, this webinar series today will be again OMI focused. On Thursday, my colleague Pawan will give an overview of TropOMI and in session three, we're going to demonstrate Python tools we've made available uh, for analyzing both OMI and TropOMI data. Um, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, we're going to go over uh, existing satellite capabilities for global NO2 observations, describe current NO2 data products available from OMI, ozone monitoring instrument, identify various air quality monitoring applications utilizing OMI NO2 observations, and I'm going to show you how to perform a data download of OMI or, and or TropOMI data. Um, before I begin overall, I would like to start a poll. I would like to know how many RSET air quality trainings our audience has taken. Great, so it looks like about 75% of people answered and it looks like almost half have never taken an RSET air quality training. Um, so welcome, we're happy, always happy to have new and returning people. So first, we're gonna talk briefly in general about remote sensing of trace gases. To remotely sense something is to collect information about an object without being in direct physical contact with it. Our eyes are an example of a remote sensing system. Your eyes receive information about a scene in the visible wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum and your brain processes and interprets this information. Passive sensors like OMI or TropOMI depend on the sun as the sole source of light or energy. Solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, hits a, tar hits a target surface like forest, water, or city, and is either absorbed, reflected, or transmitted back through the atmosphere. The intensity or strength of this reflected and emitted radiation is influenced by the characteristics of the surface, whether it's ocean or snow or desert or forest, and the characteristics of the atmosphere. Different wavelengths respond differently to physical properties of the surface or the atmosphere. So when solar radiation interacts with, with each of these, it contains the signature of those objects or the air it traveled through, and that is a key component of satellite remote sensing. So satellites detect the backscattered and or emitted thermal radiation, a process that's represented here in this graphic on your screen. Each trace gas has a distinct spectra. So if we know how and by what amount different molecules absorb radiation at different wavelengths, we can identify a, a fingerprint for each atmospheric constituent. Based on the radiation detected by the instrument, retrieval algorithms or a model are used to infer physical quantities such as number density, partial pressure, or column amount. However, even though each trace gas has a distinct spectra or fingerprint, we're rarely, if ever, observing only a single trace gas. So the figure here kind of represents this. You're, you're never looking at just one fingerprint on something. You have multiple fingerprints. Um, and just like these multiple fingerprints, spectral signatures will ov often overlap. Typically, retrieval algorithms use the difference between at least two wavelengths to retrieve a species of interest, one that exhibits absorption by the species and one that does not. The right-hand plot shows a simple version of this concept schematically. The pink line represents absorption as a function of wavelength over a short wavelength range for an example species. Lambda one represents a wavelength that's not absorbed by the species, and lambda two represents one that is. Again, this is a very simplified picture. A lot of, uh, most retrieval algorithms use multiple wavelengths. Okay. 
Passive sensors measuring solar backscatter like OMI and TROPOMI can't readily distinguish where in the atmosphere a constituent is. They're typically measuring the entire atmosphere column. That is the amount of a species between the surface and the top of the atmosphere. Because they're measuring this quantity, limited to no vertical information is available when viewing from a nadir pointing instrument. However, especially for a species like NO2, some information on vertical distribution can be inferred by taking the altitude of the trace gas source and its lifetime into account. So shorter lived species like NO2 or SO2 are strongly enhanced in the planetary boundary layer, which is the layer closest to the Earth's surface. They're strongly enhanced in the boundary layer because of their strong surface sources and short atmospheric lifetimes. And you can see very high gradients in NO2 as an example in these plots on the right-hand side of the page. Longer lived species like ozone and carbon monoxide show weaker vertical variation, making isolation of their amount of these species in the PBL with planetary boundary layer very difficult. Raw information from a satellite, as well as each level of processing, is assigned a data processing level. This table gives a brief, somewhat OMI-specific overview of each of these levels. The actual definitions can vary somewhat from sensor to sensor. So level zero data includes raw, unprocessed instrument and payload data at full instrument resolution. Level 1A are unprocessed uh, and it can include supplementary information like georeferencing parameters that haven't been applied to the data. Level B or level 1A that have been processed to sensor units. Not all instruments have level 1B data. Level 2 data contain the derived geophysical variables at the same resolution and location as the level 1 source data. Level 2G and level 3 are mapped on uniform space-time grids, usually with some completeness and consistency. And level four data result from analyses of these lower level data. Today, we'll be talking about level two, level two G, level three, and level four data products. So typically level two and level three data are most often used for trace gas analysis. So how do you choose which one to use? Level three data is typically gridded and is probably the easiest to use. Usually quality flags and filtering criteria have been applied for the user. But because level three represents, you know, essentially an area weighted average, the data can be influenced by differences in sampling rather than true geophysical differences. So any user should be cautious when drawing conclusions. Level two data provides the user with a bit more control. Level two data usually contains details on the performance of the algorithm and also contains other parameters, such as quality flags and in ancillary data sets. So a, an advanced user can decide which data to use or to not use. The current spatial resolution of trace gas measurements is on the order of tens of kilometers. These resolutions are good enough to map tropospheric concentration fields on local to regional scales, but are also fine enough to resolve sources like individual power plants and large cities. For species with short atmospheric lifetimes, like NO2, averaging over these larger satellite pixels can lead to significant dilution of signals from point sources, which can complicate quantitative analysis and separation of emission sources. So we're always looking for higher and higher spatial resolutions. Higher spatial resolution would also improve cloud clearing techniques, leading to more accurate retrievals, as well as increasing the likelihood of being able to see between the clouds.
to illustrate the improvements we've seen in spatial resolution. You can see on your screen here the difference between GOM2, which was launched in 2002 on the right, and OMI on the left. GOM2 has a spatial resolution of 80 by 40 kilometers squared, whereas OMI has a spatial resolution of 24 by 13 kilometers squared. And you can see in the OMI data, the features are sharper, and you can begin to see some uh, sources that don't appear in the GOM2 data. And going even from OMI to now TROPOMI is a dramatic leap in spatial resolution. You can see, again, you can see sources in the TROPOMI data that are too small to be resolved in the coarser resolution OMI data. TROPOMI uh, NO2 data have a resolution of three and a half by seven kilometers squared. And not only can you see these smaller sources, but in, um, hopefully you can see this on your screen, in some cases you can actually see sort of the plume being advected in the wind. It's really impressive. We're very excited. <laughs> and on top of TROPOMI, the next generation of measurements will be a constellation of geostationary instruments. Um, the TEMPO mission, which stands for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring Pollution, is one of three geostationary missions aiming to measure atmospheric composition. The Sentinel-4 mission is a mission from the European Space Agency and has a prospective launch date of 2022 to 23. GEMS, the Geostationary Environment Monitoring Spectrometer, is a Korean instrument and should hopefully launch within the next year. Um, so these three missions will comprise a global pollution monitoring constellation um, where each instrument won't provide global coverage, but um, whereas polar orbiting satellites like OMI and TROPOMI only overpass a certain location once a day, geostationary will provide us hourly measurements over the region they cover. So in this next section, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the OMI instrument. The OMI, or ozone monitoring instrument, is a hyperspectral imager that observes solar backscatter radiation in the visible and ultraviolet. The Earth is viewed in 740 wavelength bands with a spectral resolution of about 0.5 nanometers. OMI is on board the Aura satellite which is a low Earth orbit at 705 kilometers above the Earth. And it has an equator crossing time or overpass time of about 1.45 PM. The OMI satellite track has a swath large enough to provide global coverage in about 14 or 15 orbits over the course of a day. However, the row anomaly has actually blocked some of these rows and we'll talk more about that in a minute. The nominal resolution at Nader is 13 by 24 kilometers squared, but increases towards the edge of the swath where the pixel size can be over 100 kilometers. Several available products from OMI besides NO2 are listed here and include total and tropospheric column ozone and NO2, aerosol optical depth in the UV, and total column formaldehyde and SO2. So each OMI product file is called a data granule and covers the sunlit portion of the orbit with an approximately 2,600 kilometer wide swath. These contain 60 binned pixels or scenes on each viewing line. During normal operations, 14 or 15 granules of these are produced daily, and these provide full coverage of the globe every day. Just to note, this is in contrast to aerosol observations um, at much higher spatial resolution. So here, a file contains an entire orbit, which is about 90 minutes. Whereas for an instrument like MODIS, some products are so high resolution that they're only available in five minute increments. So the OMI row anomaly is a result of a hardware issue on the satellite. There's literally something in the way blocking the view. It started in about 2007 and grew until 2012. 
at which point it was affecting almost 50% of the data. But since 2012, it hasn't grown. Um, you can see the effects of the row anomaly in a, this pre-anomaly picture on the left of August 2005. And you can see the effects of the row anomaly in the picture from 2015. So in this webinar series, we're focusing a lot on nitrogen dioxide. So why, why do we measure NO2? NO2 plays a key role in atmospheric chemistry by controlling the production of tropospheric ozone, warming aerosol nitrates, and affecting the abundance of the hydroxyl radical and therefore influencing lifetimes of greenhouse gases. NO2 is a pollutant regulated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, as it's detrimental to human health and ecosystems. Sources of NO2 include combustion, soil emissions, lightning, and fires. As I've said previously, the relatively short lifetime of NO2, which is about hours to days, leads to large concentrations in the planetary boundary layer closest to the Earth's surface with respect to the free troposphere and large spatial gradients around sources. For this reason, NO2 observations have commonly been used to constrain bottom-up inventories. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The version three OMI NO2 standard product is called OMNO2 and is available from the NASA Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center. Um, we are going to do a data download from this um, facility. And I've included the reference at the end of this presentation um, for the version three standard product. Each file contains one swath, as I stated earlier, an example of which you can see on your screen. Next is the OMNO2G product. So this is a level 2G daily global gridded product. It's based on the OMNO2 product. This is a special level 2 gridded product where the pixel data are binned into quarter by quarter degree global grids. So each grid cell contains the data for any level two scene that has an observation time between the UTC times of zero and 24C for a given day. So all data pixels that fall within this grid box are saved without averaging. OMNO2D is the level three daily global gridded product. It's a quarter by a quarter degree so if this product, again, is gridded where pixel level data of good quality are binned and averaged into these quarter by quarter degree bin grids. This product contains total column NO2 and total troposphere column NO2 for all atmospheric conditions and for sky conditions where the cloud fraction is less than 30%. This slide shows the structure of an OMI data file name. The first part in purple shows the instrument ID, in this case, OMI Aura. The peach color shows the data type, in this case, level two OM NO2, or if you were looking at SO2 data, OM SO2. Next in green is the observation date and time. First is the four digit year followed by an M, followed by the two digit month and day. Next is a T and the time in GMT in two digit hours and minutes. Next in blue is an O followed by the orbit number. And next in brown is the collection or version number. In our case, version three. Next in gray is the production or processing date and time. This is the same format as the observation time, except that the time goes to seconds instead of minutes. All of these files can be read using various tools, such as the ones listed here, but can't be opened with something like a text editor or Excel. The OMI NO2 files are HDF5 files and could therefore be readable by any software that can read NetCDF4 files. And we're going to um, demonstrate some tools in our third session, how to uh, read and analyze these files. 
These are some of the relevant variables found in the AMNO2 files. So all NO2 in the atmosphere column is found in the troposphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere closest to the surface, or the stratosphere, the level above the troposphere that contains the ozone layer. The AMNO2 retrieval algorithm retrieves both the stratospheric and tropospheric column amounts. So column amount NO2 trope is the estimated tropospheric column amount of NO2, while column amount NO2 strat is the estimated stratospheric column amount of NO2. A satellite, retrieval a satellite retrieval algorithm is made up of the satellite observations as well as a priori information, usually from a model. Over unpolluted areas with very low values of NO2, so very clean regions, the retrieved tropospheric NO2 column is dominated by the a priori or model column amount and can also be affected by the assumptions made about stratosphere versus troposphere. As a result of this, many of the values over those unpolluted areas, for example, over the open ocean are small negative numbers. When computing statistics over a region like this, such as the mean, the median, the variance, it's important to include all of these valid measurements, regardless of their fine, There's regardless of their sign, to avoid biasing your results. The AMINO2 documentation advises looking at several parameters in order to filter the data. Users are advised to only use scenes where the radiative cloud fraction is less than 0.5, the solar zenith angle is less than 85 degrees, and the terrain reflectivity is less than 0.3. The terrain reflectivity is a measure of how reflective the surface of the Earth is. This is a unitless quantity and must be multiplied by a scale factor of 0 0.001 to obtain the actual number. The cloud radiance fraction is an estimate of the fraction of photons reaching the satellite instrument that come from cloud-covered parts of the scene. It's also unitless and must be multiplied by a scale factor of 0 0.001 to obtain the actual number. The solar zenith angle is the angle between the zenith and the center of the sun's disk, where the zenith is the imaginary point directly above a particular location. Solar zenith angle variable can be found in the geolocation information, and we'll discuss that more uh, when we're looking through the files. All variables have been filtered for the row anomaly and any observation modes where the retrieval doesn't perform well. These will be integrated by fill values equal to the large negative number shown on your screen. I also want to point out that there is a higher resolution level three product available at uh, two different temporal resolutions. These were created by my colleague, Locke Lamsall, in a manner very similar to the quarter degree files available from the GES disk I described earlier. These daily files can be found at the URL on your screen in HDF5 format, and monthly files can be found in both text and NetCDF format. And before I move on to the next section, I'm going to give a couple of polls. The first What does a passive satellite directly measure? The amount of pollution, top of the atmosphere radiance, surface reflected, or the count of NO2 molecules in the atmosphere? Okay, it looks like we have a tie between top of the atmosphere radiance and surface reflectance. Uh, the correct answer is top of the atmosphere radiance. Um, surface, will ref surface reflectance will affect how much radiation reaches the top of the atmosphere, but the radiance is what the satellite is directly measuring. Another poll, let's see, what does OMI stand for? 
Okay, yay. 83% ozone monitoring instrument. Just checking to see if everybody's paying attention. So in this section, um, we're gonna go just highlight some applications and research using OMI data. This animation shows changes in NO2 from 2005 to 2016 from OMI. Large decreases on the order of 20 to 50% are associated with the implementation of state and federal regulations to reduce NOx emissions from power plants and cars. The only areas of increases occurred over areas of oil and natural gas extraction activities, such as in North Dakota and Texas. We can see a more detailed view of some of those increases here. The left plots show trends in OMI NO2 from 2005 to 2014. While more urban areas like Bismarck, North Dakota, and Houston, Dallas, and Austin, Texas show decreasing NO2 trends, other areas show significant increases. And when we look at the Veers at night, the Lights at Night product, we can see these areas lit up, not because of population density, but because of gas flaring. Satellites can also be used to provide timely information to update bottom-up emissions inventories until a new inventory is completed. Creating a bottom-up emissions inventory is a major undertaking that can, that can require time to complete. As an example, currently, the most up-to-date U.S. emissions inventory is the NEI 2017. An example of using satellite data in this way is a Lompcell et al. 2011 study. They first used a three-dimensional chemistry transport model to estimate how changes in emissions relate to changes in the model atmospheric column. So how the model emissions relate to the model column. Then they used this relationship to predict changes in the emissions based on changes in the observed atmospheric column. Using this technique, they could estimate trends in the emissions past the latest inventory date. Similar to the previous slide, satellites can also detect unexpected changes in trends. So if an emissions inventory has been projected in the future, it's usually based on economic information or potentially um, emissions reductions plans. But there are times when <clears throat> unexpected events happen, such as economic recession, natural disasters, such as hurricanes, uh, policy interventions, such as uh, the implementation of strict pollution control measures in advance of the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games, and also civil unrest. These plots are taken from Brian Duncan's OMI Trends paper. Civil unrest began in Syria in 2011. The displacement and disruptions of millions of people can be seen in the large decreases over the region. Because of the daily coverage of satellite observations, it's possible to investigate finer temporal scales of emissions. A study by Beerley et al. in 2003 used GOM NO2 and observed different weekly cycles of NO2 emissions in different parts of the world. For example, predominantly Christian countries saw reductions on Sundays, and areas dominated by power plant emissions saw little to no weekly cycle. On longer timescales, since each NOx source has specific characteristics that determine the seasonal variation of the tropospheric NO2 columns, the seasonality of NO2 satellite observations can be used to identify the dominant sources of emissions. For example, regions that are dominated by anthropogenic emissions usually have a seasonal NO2 maximum in the winter. Biomass burning of forests and savanna usually take place during the dry season, such as early spring. Soil emissions can result in enhanced NO2 signals in summertime. Using these characteristics, Van der Rey et al. in 2008 first identified the dominant sources of NOx emissions on a global scale at a resolution of one by one degree on the basis of both GOM and Skiamaki measurements. 
satellite observations of NO2 have also been used to evaluate three-dimensional chemistry transport models. Here you can see that the CMAC model is overestimating NO2 over sources and urban areas, but underestimating NO2 in more rural areas. And this is just a very quick example. And because of the reasons I, I discussed earlier, short lifetime, large gradients, high concentration in the boundary layer, surface trends in NO2 tend to correlate very well with the trends in the entire tropospheric column. The plots on the left, the middle and the left, show surface measurements of NO2 as well as co-located tropospheric column NO2 from OMI. The trends in the two data sets shown in the column on the right show very good agreement. Some researchers have used tropospheric column NO2 to estimate surface level NO2. Their approach starts with retrievals of the NO2 tropospheric column. Here on the left, we see a graphic of a satellite measuring the backscattered radiation from which the column seen on the right can be calculated. Using the retrieved columns, along with information about the vertical distribution from an atmospheric chemistry model, they estimate the relationship between the column and the surface. Here V is the satellite to model, model column ratio. The lower equation uses this relationship to relate the model surface concentrations to the model boundary layer. This plot shows an example of annual mean surface NO2 for 2005. Noted on the plot is the spatial correlation versus in situ measurements over North America is 0.78. And this is a research product and not an official NASA product. This table shows information about several satellite-based surface NO2 estimates. The group at the University of Dalhousie has two products, one based on GOM Skiamaki and GOM2, and one based on OMI. They are both at 0.1 by 0.1 degree resolution. Here at Goddard, Locke Lamsall has developed a product based on OMI data from 2005 to 2016, and that can be found at the link on your screen, as well as the references for both of these products. Locke Lamsall's surface NO2 product was actually recently used in a health study by Susan Annenberg et al. They used annual average surface NO2 from LOCKS product, along with annual average PM2.5 and annual average ozone from a model to estimate the number of global asthma-related emergency room visits due to PM2.5, ozone, and NO2 exposure. In that study, they noted that even at 0.1 degree resolution, this resolution was still too coarse because of the very, very high gradients in NO2. So at this point, we're going to break from our presentation, and I'm going to show you how to download OMI data. But first, for a break, let's see another poll. How about which satellite is OMI aboard? I just touched on this, but... <laughs> Okay, 80% shows the correct answer, the Aura satellite. And we'll do one more. Most of the OMI channels are in which part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Okay, and it looks like most people got this one correct as well. Most of the wavelengths, it, this is a little bit tricky because OMI measures in both the visible and the UV, but most of the wavelengths are in the UV. So from here, um, hopefully everybody, if you want to follow along with me, hopefully you've made an Earth Data account, but this recording 
will be made available. And also, I in this presentation are slides walking you through this process. So even if you aren't able to follow along in real time with me, you will be able to duplicate this. So first, we're going to go to the GES disk at disc.gsfc.nasa.gov. And we are going to search for ALMNO2. And here we see we have two options. We're going to choose OMI or a nitrogen dioxide, total and tropospheric column. And just as I showed you before, this is one orbit or swath. And I want to point out here, there is a direct link here to the subset and get the data. I'm going to walk you through that, but um, I wanted to bring you to the next screen first. So clicking on that brings this screen. Here we have a link to the documentation where you can find a README document, a user guide, OMI, uh, ATBD documents, file specification, and a link to the version 3 product. On the right-hand side, you can see several options for downloading the data. We're going to, today we're going to talk about Earth data search as well as subsetting and getting the data this way. Clicking on this, you get several options for refining your search. For today, we are going to look for 2018, August 16th. And you can also subset spatially. You click on this button, you can draw. We'll look over the United States. You can draw a box around your range or you can type in a specific range. You can also subset by variable. So here we'll expand. This is how the um, HDF files are structured. So each file contains a swath, column amount NO2, and this is separated into data fields and geolocation fields. Within the geolocation fields, you'll find variables um, such as spacecraft altitude, spacecraft latitude, longitude, but relevant to us, a solar zenith angle, which I mentioned earlier. Within the data fields, you'll find column amount NO2 trope, like that. You'll also find column amount NO2 strat, various quality flags. You'll also find terrain reflectivity, which I mentioned. Oops, oh no. There we go. As well as cloud radiance fraction, which I mentioned earlier. So we click get data. And it will list several, any file relevant to the parameters that I've mentioned. So for one day, it lists these files and it looks like it eliminated my bounding box because it should only be a couple of files. Oh, the date range, it reset. So if I go
searching for only one day should give us just a couple of files. So you can click on these individually and download them. And you can also, from this, download the README, the User's Guide, and the OMI ATBD. Another way to get the data is to use Earth Data Search. Clicking on that We click on our product. And from here, you can see a preview of the different swaths. Right now, it has us downloading all granules, but we don't want that level of data. So here at the bottom is where you control your date parameters. So if we zoom out, we see each year available. We would like 2018. And then we zoom in to month and click on August. Zoom in further to day. Click on 16. And these are the data granules available for this day. We can click on a single swath. I want to zoom out here. You can zoom out. And mousing over each one will tell you which file it belongs to. So you can see in the middle here that it, this is highlighted, as well as this. If you want to select a region of interest similar to what we did in the last option, you can click a spatial rectangle and drag a rectangle over your region of interest, which brings up only the relevant swaths. You can download each of these individually using this button, where it will save, you can save directly to your system. Going back to the GES disk, we can also search for tropomy. And you can see the various data products that are available. Uh, here's aerosol index, methane, cloud, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, and here we have tropospheric NO2. Clicking on NO2. You can see we don't have that subset option. We do have some documentation for the tropomi data. And we do have the availability of Earth Data Search, where you can access the data just like I showed. We click on our data set. And August. And we can look at our bounding box. And you can see all of the relevant data files and download them individually or download them all at once using this button. So before the next, um, before our next session, um, if you want to go and grab both OMI and TropOMI data for August 16th over the United States, that would be a great exercise to make sure that you're familiar with how to get the data. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, I also, before we start our Q&A, I want to point out um, a previously a previous RSET webinar that we have done, um, we use we demonstrated the Python tools previously. Um, 
and the recordings of each webinar, available Python scripts, um, Q&A transcripts are all available at this website. And I know Pawan wanted to say a couple of words um, in preparation for um, our next session on Thursday uh, before we open the Q&A. Pawan, are you there? Thanks, Melanie. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thanks, Melanie, for I think that was a really good uh, session and introduction to the uh, data sets uh, from OMI and some introduction to the TROP OMI, which we are going to cover more in week, not week two, the part two, which is next Thursday, this Thursday, and then uh, we will do the part three on Monday. So I just want to uh, give you briefly so that you are uh, prepared for part two and part three. So if you look the screen right now, this is a RSET training page which uh, through which you all have registered. On the same page, you will find all the details about this webinar series, uh, including the PowerPoint presentation from this week. Can you browse it down a little bit, Melanie? Uh, so if you look, uh, there are three parts, uh, part one. So we already have presentation slides here. You will also find uh, recording of this uh, session once it is completed and you will also find question and answer transcripts there those who are new to the RC training this is uh, uh, typically we provide uh, for each of the, our sessions so all those who missed uh, for whatever reason they can go back and check those things uh, once we reach to the session two you will see similar uh, items in the uh, part two and then part three. Now, if you go a little bit up in the web page, uh, there is a pre rack section. Uh, Melanie, can you browse a little bit up? Thank you. Yes, so on the pre rack section, uh, one of them is the fundamental of remote sensing. Uh, it is highly recommended for the folks who have not taken any air quality training in the past or who or those who do not have any experience with remote sensing. Uh, Melanie did cover some of the fundamental in today's session, but it is also highly recommended if you go back and see those, uh, they will give you a little bit more into details about how satellite works and how we extract this uh, information about pollutants in the atmospheres. Uh, the second bullet is download install the Python with Anaconda. Uh, in part three of this webinar series, we will do live uh, decode, uh, do the coding, uh, run some of the codes which will read, extract, and map TROP OMI and OMI data. Uh, and we will use for that Python 3.6.5 version uh, from the Anaconda package. So please, please download that instruction. Make sure you have all the packages installed. Make sure your Anaconda and the Python codes, uh, Python is working properly before session three, which is or part three, I would say, which is on next Monday. Uh, uh, we will again talk about that in the, uh, on Thursday, just to make sure that you have all the tools required. Uh, if you do not have, Melanie already showed how to get the data from Earth data uh, today uh, on OMI and TROP OMI. If you do not have the login, make sure you create your login and add those applications to your area so that you can download the data. Uh, Sentinel Hub instruction is also there. Please make sure you register there. And uh, that's another way to get the TROP OMI data. We will go over that uh, in week or in part two. Uh, then again, I think uh, in part two, we will use another tool to visualize uh, TROP OMI data. It's called Panoply. It's an open source code created by NASA to read and uh, uh, read, map, and extract the data from the files. Uh, usually, uh, satellite data files usually comes in HDF, HDF5, or NetCDF format. So Panoply can handle all these three formats, and we are going to look uh, some example. Uh, we will do an exercise uh, in part two. So make sure you have Panoply installed before Thursday. 
part to session because we are going to do a uh, live demo on that. You can also download, there are four different data sets uh, coming from the uh, Probomi. They are Aeroso Index, uh, NO2, SO2, I believe, or Methane, and CO. There are four different files. Uh, all comes in that CDF format. So please download those data as well uh, They uh, so that we can go through the Panoply exercise uh, in part two. So with that, uh, I think uh, if you have any other questions, uh, we are going through the question answer session now uh, and Melanie and I will be happy to answer. And please make sure you complete all this requirement uh, before Thursday uh, for the part two so that we can uh, do exercise and you can get maximum out of this webinar series. With that, thank you, Melanie. Um, you can check over now. Sounds good. Okay, so at this point, we'll take some time to answer some questions. Um, the transcript of this will be available, um, as Paul said, scroll down here. Um, on the uh, on the RSED webpage. Okay. So first question, can you explain the variables that are in the data set like it has flags and others? If you could explain all of those that we see. Um, well, what I, there are, as you can see from when I showed the subset, um, there are a lot of different variables. Um, for descriptions of every single variable, you can refer to the documentation but I tried to highlight the variables that would be most important if you wanted to filter the data yourselves. Um, and those products were terrain reflectivity, cloud radiance fraction, and solar zenith angle. Um, so terrain reflectivity, just to go over it, um, it's just a measure of how reflective the surface of the earth is. Um, cloud radiance fraction is the amount of clouds. Clouds can interfere with a retrieval um, and reduce the, the certainty. And solar zenith angle is the measure between the point directly above a location and the center of the sun's disk. At large angles, um, the retrieval is, is again not as certain. Um, but for specifics about other flags within the data, you can refer to the documentation that we showed uh, how to link to. Question two, can you also share the resource that talks about how data are pulled creating gridded data like the level three? Um, I believe the, as far as filtering, um, the criteria that I just described and that are included in the presentation are what's used to filter the level two data to create the level three. Uh, as far as the very specific area weighting that goes into, um, I'm not sure the version three documentation goes into that. I will try to look through and when we post the Q&A, I'll try and link to um, a reference for this. OMI detected NO2 change detection map. Which variable are you using? Um, for the GIF where I showed the decreases in NO2 seen over the United States, those are decreases in troposphere column NO2. Um, if I remember the figure clearly, annual NO2, I noticed that the NO2 hotspot over the Pacific coast of California has not reduced as much compared to the eastern U.S. in spite of stringent air quality regulation. Any explanation? NO2. I'm not sure which figure you're referencing. Let me take a quick look. Um, if this figure is referencing trends, 
I am looking through my figures. One moment. Okay, I think um, this person is referencing um, the annual trend figure. Um, so uh, there's still large amounts of NO2 seen in the Los Angeles region. And I think um, that's also a function of uh, terrain and meteorology that's in a valley, which tends to trap the amount of pollutants. Um, question, can I correlate the OMI information with the MODIS information for wildfire applications? Um, so Aura flies, uh, sorry, our OMI flies on the Aura satellite, um, which has a very similar overpass time as the Aqua satellite. Um, they have, for, um, for MODIS information for wildfire applications, I'm assuming you're referencing uh, fire detection, burned area, or aerosol optical depth. Um, these uh, are on very different spatial resolutions. So in a qualitative sense, yes, I would say you can. But if you're going to be quantitative, um, you would have to map one to the other grid uh, or um, swath. Um, Sentinel-5 is an ESA product from Copernicus mission, isn't it? Yes. It's available also under a NASA platform. Yes, we are very fortunate to be able to distribute the TROPA-OMI data through um, the GES disk. Um, I had an issue downloading data set four. Is there another way to get this data set? When I click data set four, the, sh the site shows the page is no longer available. And it looks like Pawan is writing something. Okay, so it looks like something that's going that we're going to cover in the next part on Thursday. Um, any way to analyze without a GUI tool like Panoply and with a CLI tool or script? I apologize, but I do not know what a CLI tool or script is. Um, Pawan, do you know what a CLI tool is? No, I'm not familiar with CLI, but we are going to do the panoply uh, in uh, we, in part two uh, to uh, read and map some of these data sets. Okay. Well, pa um, Selwyn just <laughs> informed me that CLI stands for command line interface. Um, so is, if, does that reference a language like Python or IDL? Yes, absolutely. Um, you... Um, there are many libraries in Python and IDL, um, and we're, we're going to share some Python scripts. Um, how can we process multiple HDF files? Um, if you're referring to within the scripts that we're going to provide, we will show you ways. We're going to process one file at a time, but we'll show you where you can modify the scripts. Um, to process multiple files. Do we treat satellite data as primary or secondary data in our own research? Not sure I understand that question. Um, satellite data, um, as we've said, you know, satellites record top of the atmosphere radiance, um, but we, a huge part of making satellite measurements is establishing ground truth. Um, so measurements made from the surface um, to validate our satellite measurements. Um, but I'm not sure what, it, what you would mean by primary or secondary data. Okay, there are studies of movement 
management of pollutants, for example, in O2, if they exist, in which platform can we analyze them? Would it help us to know the source of the contamination in O2? And if it moves globally, could a temporary analysis be done? I'm not, okay, I'm not exactly sure what this question is asking, but um, for a species like NO2, um, it has a very short lifetime. So um, NO2 itself would not have, if you had a perturbation or a contamination, you would not see that globally. You would not see a global signal. But there are, there has been research on um, NO2 plumes. Um, but as I've said before, it's, it's a good quantity to measure by satellite because it has such a short lifetime and such high spatial gradients. Um, and I'm not sure what I'm not sure what this person means about which platform can we analyze them. Hopefully, we'll provide you some tools to be able to visualize um, the data. Um, Okay, are we able to do this analysis in ArcGIS? Have you tried this? Um, I am not familiar personally with ArcGIS, um, but I believe you can, yeah, no, I think, um, I think the downloads are only available in um, HDF or NetCDF format from the GES disk. Um, but I'm, I don't know if ArcGIS can handle NetCDF. It can, okay. But I'm, unfortunately, we don't, um, I don't personally have knowledge of how to do that. So I wouldn't be able to troubleshoot or answer any questions. Can we use Python or Panoply to extract point data values? Uh, for, I'm not sure about Panoply, but for Python, yes, and that will be one of the scripts that we uh, demonstrate in our third part. How consistent are the OMI-derived spectral AOD and single scattering albedo retrievals when compared to ground other satellite retrievals? Um, OMI retrieves AOD in the UV, which I believe has been um, evaluated against um, AeroNet measurements. I don't have knowledge about um, the errors. Maybe potentially Pawan has an idea, um, but I can look for um, some documentation or a paper on uh, OMI AOD and link it here. For tropospheric NO2 column, can you recommend a minimum column value that is above an uncertainty threshold? That's a very good question. And I don't have an exact answer, so I am going to look that up. And again, I will update this answer um, once I have um, more certain information. Which is the lower extension we can use OMI data. Is it the spatial resolution? Um, if that is, if, is, if this question is asking, what's the finest resolution of OMI data? That is it. Um, as far as a gridded product, the 0.1 by 0.1 degree product is the finest gridded product we currently offer. But um, no, that is the finest resolution that OMI can be used. Um, can we obtain average data for one month of level NO2 data? Um, the short answer is no, but you can use the, if you want to use level two, you can potentially use the AMNO2G to, um, 
to tell you which swaths overlap a potential location over the course of a month. Um, can NO2 data from OMI be combined with data from other sensors to improve resolution? Um, I don't think it's typically used with other sensors, but there are techniques uh, for OMI downscaling using either high resolution chemical transport models or very, very high resolution land use regression models. Some work has been done using these techniques. Um, but with tropomy, um, with the introduction of tropomy, we do have much higher resolution available. It doesn't help us for past periods, but for the future. Have you thought about the workflow that is template and can be used for real-time analytics of the work that you showed? Say you just picked one time, but how about we can process the time series on the fly and if we can share those results or workflow as web services? Um, I'm, so I'm assuming you're speaking about downloading the data. Um, and if you noticed when I was doing the, um, the data download, there was an open DAP link for the OMI data. So that's something that you can pick up um, potentially in near real time. I'm not sure about subsetting it though. I think that would be something that would have to happen on your machine rather than um, automating that on the end of the GES disk. Um, there is a version 3.7 available on the website, but you referred 3.6.5. Should I install the 3.7 version? Oh, um, so this question is likely uh, in reference to Python. Um, uh, Pollen can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 3.7 should be fine. Oh, I or think, uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no, please. I, we would strictly recommend you get 3.6.5 because the codes which we have created are tested on that. Uh, I'm hoping they will run on 3.7, but we cannot guarantee. So for this specific exercise, we will recommend to use 3.6.5. Right, so you can walk through the exercises with us. So we can guarantee you can walk through the exercises with us. Um, is there any source of data for ethane measurements? From satellite? No, there's no standard product. Um, I'm not sure of even any research products. Um, that are available for ethane. Um, I will, I'll, I'll check and update this if I, if I find anything, but anything would be a strictly a research product. Um, do you know how the tropospheric ozone column product from tropomy compares to OMI? Um, I do not, uh, but as far as um, as far as data quality, I, I'm not sure. But as far as magnitudes, I don't think you're going to see big changes in the tropospheric ozone column with increasing spatial resolution the way that you likely will with a species like NO2 or SO2 that have a very high lifetime, a short lifetime, and high spatial gradients. Can we access the data using an API? Um, the only, I'm not sure, but I think the fastest way to get it would be the open DAP server that it's on. But I don't have a terrible amount of knowledge about APIs. Um, how is OMI NO2 level three data obtained, considering that there may be a potential difference of 90 minutes between granules? Yeah, uh, there is a difference of 90 minutes, but because of the nature of the orbit, it is overpassing the, 
the each location at about the same time of day. Um, so the overpass time for OMI is about 1.30, 1.45 in the afternoon. So they are 90 minutes apart, but it's sampling each location at the same time. Is the available OMI data suitable for daily assessment of regional NO2 concentrations in subtropical areas with up to 60% cloud cover and high relative humidity? Um, for daily assessment, um, you might find the data to be noisy because of the cloud cover. And as far as regional NO2 concentrations, um, again, you're, it's going to depend sort of on the chemistry of your area, how high your suburban or rural um, backgrounds are going to be. So I'm not sure. In other words, if a cloud is covering, cliff cloud cover is covering your urban center and sort of a suburban or rural um, part of your region is in view, I'm not sure what conclusions you'd be able to draw from one to the other. Can we use level three gridded data for scientific research? Yes. Definitely. Um, <laughs> um, le uh, level three gridded data um, can be very useful. But, uh, it's definitely the easiest to use. So if you're a new user, um, level three data is a good way to sort of get introduced to using satellite data. It looks like the questions have kind of tapered off. Um, so, uh, Pawan, do you have anything that, uh, do you have any more specifics of anything that I've touched on? No, I think that was good. Uh, we'll, I think this is good. Uh, again, if you have st st still questions, feel free to email us. Uh, yep. Our response may be delayed um, just due to this ongoing webinar, but we will try to get back to you as soon as we can. And uh, if you have any other specific feedback, please provide us and uh, we will meet again everyone on Thursday, same time, uh, and we'll learn more about the TROPOMI new satellite and its data sets. Sounds good. Thank you everybody for joining us and we will talk to you again Thursday. Thank you.